Hello, everyone. I'm Evan Kovac. I'm an associate professor and also the residency associate program director at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in Newark, New Jersey. I'm also affiliated with the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. I want to thank the leadership of the Empire Group for inviting me to present to you. Today, I'm going to present on the latest in prostate cancer early detection and touch upon some of the more salient points of the latest AUA guidelines. So I would like to start by saying that we of course have a credibility issue in our specialty. And when primary care physicians think of urologists, they often think of Scrooge McDuck who's out to make and protect his money. And I think that nothing could be further from, from the truth in that regard. Uh, we all wanna do what's right for our patients, and we all want to treat them according to the latest evidence. And so, again, we're going to talk about some of the more salient points of the AUA guidelines. Of course, we're not going to touch upon all of the guideline statements that would extend beyond the scope of this lecture. And, of course, you're free to go and read and even memorize the guidelines. I think the purpose of this lecture is more to understand some of the guidelines, the evidence that supports some of these guidelines, some of the uh, the more avant-garde statements that have been made in these guidelines, I think are worth noting. And so we'll go uh, point by point through some of them. And uh, hopefully through this lecture, you'll gain some understanding uh, and some insights into the evidence that led to the creation of these guidelines. So some of the questions that have been answered in these guidelines are, should men undergo prostate cancer screening? At what age should prostate cancer screening begin? How frequently should prostate cancer screening be performed? When can prostate cancer screening be stopped? And what diagnostic tests in addition to prostate specific antigen or PSA are available to us as urologists at, for the early diagnosis of prostate cancer? So first and foremost, should men undergo prostate cancer screening? And the answer is, Yes. And that concludes my lecture. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, seriousness. Uh, yes, I, I do believe that men should undergo prostate cancer screening. So let's dive into some of the evidence supporting that. Uh, later, we're going to be talking about shared decision making, which is from the AUA guidelines, but also the United States Preventative Service Task Force. And we're going to talk about what exactly is shared decision making. What does it mean for the physician and the patient? So first, uh, defining the issue, why is this controversial at all? Well, I propose to you that PSA and radical prostatectomy do save lives. This is data uh, from a while back from the CD, CB, uh, sorry, from the CDC, published in 2005, looking at prostate cancer specific mortality. And prostate cancer screening has certainly uh, led to a decrease in prostate cancer specific mortality. Of course, the caveat or the flip side to that is the overdiagnosis and overtreatment of prostate cancers that are not meant to do harm, that are non-lethal. And so this is the balance that we need to strike between uh, saving people's lives, uh, preventing prostate cancer specific mortality, but also not overtreating the ones that are not destined to do bad things. The range of overdiagnosis and overtreatment uh, is wide. It can be anywhere between around two to over 65%, depending on the study that you look at. So this decrease in cancer-specific mortality since the introduction of widespread, widespread PSA screening is, in my opinion, using PSA badly. So imagine what we can accomplish if we use PSA in a better way. It's important to talk about the studies that are in favor of PSA screening. We, of course, have the prostate cancer uh, screening trial from the United States. Uh, sorry, so this is the one from Europe, the ERSPC, uh, which now has several years of follow-up, uh, up to 16 years now, I believe, uh, according to the latest uh, study. Uh, we also have a standalone trial that was incorporated into the ERSPC. This is the Yoderberg trial from Sweden. But even though it was incorporated into the European data, it was its own standalone randomized trial. And we have also a finished trial that didn't reach statistical significance, but was approaching uh, or supportive of PSA screening in terms of saving lives. 
Uh, risk reduction of prostate cancer specific mortality in the ERSPC it was around 20% or has a ratio of 0.79. In the Yoderberg trial, which is the most impressive data that we have to date, it almost halved the risk of dying from prostate cancer. Uh, does that apply to the American population? Uh, that's controversial because we have dissimilar populations and uh, also uh, Swedish men tend to not move around a lot. Um, they tend to be quite homogenous. So does that really apply to our population? Uh, it, that's questionable. Then we have the Finnish trial, uh, which did not reach statistical significance, but the hazard ratio was around 0.85. So here are the raw stats. The number needed to screen in Yoderberg, 293. Men needed to be screened in order to save one life from prostate cancer. Uh, about double that, 570 in the ERSPC and about 1,200 in the Finnish trial. Number needed to treat, only 12 in Yoderberg, which is very much in line with breast cancer data uh, with regards to partial and radical mastectomy. Although prostate cancer screening receives a lot more fanfare it's much more controversial in the public eye compared to breast cancer screening. Uh, 18 in the ERSPC and 25 in the finished trial. Of course, we have to talk about PLCO, the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian trial. This is the American trial that was published. It enrolled 76,000 men to organized versus opportunistic screening. And this in here lies the, the crux of the trial. It was not no screening, it was opportunistic screening. And they felt that the contamination rate in this trial would be quite low and it would still allow them to accrue enough patients. Unfortunately, it did not show uh, a, a reduction in mortality in the intervention arm. But of course, this was due to widespread contamination in the control arm. And the latest data published on the trial is... 90% contamination. So at what age should prostate cancer screening begin? According to the guidelines, of an average risk man should begin at the age of 50. And at increased risk, so if you have a strong family history, especially a first degree relative with prostate cancer, uh, if you are of a higher genetic group, namely the BRCA, but there are others, uh, then you should begin at the age of 45. Now, how frequently should prostate cancer screening be for, performed? I'm going to move my little avatar down here so you can see the words on the screen a little bit easier. So I would like to introduce to you the novel concept of baseline PSA screening and risk stratification versus a one-size-fits-all annual screening paradigm for patients that has been followed up until now This is from the Canadian Neurological Association guidelines, and they have introduced baseline PSA paradigm uh, into their screening guidelines. And this is for average risk men between the ages of 50 and 70. And it then goes on to risk stratify patients based on their baseline PSA. So if your PSA is under one, you can repeat testing every four years. If it's between one to three, every two years. And then if the PSA is greater than three, you may need more frequent testing or additional tests or go see a urologist with regards to receiving a biopsy. And so I think this is a much more nuanced approach to PSA screening and certainly helps to reduce the overdiagnosis and overtreatment of indolent cancers. Uh, although it does take a paradigm shift, uh, instead of screening everyone every year, you might need to do it every four years. And then it, it comes down to keeping track of these patients. But hey, if the gastroenterologist can do it, and keep track of patients and get their colonoscopies every five to 10 years, then why can't we do the same thing? If you've ever been to a urologic oncology conference, you certainly have seen this quote from Willett Whitmore, who is considered by many to be the, the father or the parent of, of urologic oncology. And he said that, is it possible to cure prostate cancer when it is necessary, but also is it necessary to cure prostate cancer when it is possible? And I think this describes the state of prostate cancer perfectly. Most prostate cancers are not destined to do harm, but there are those that are deadly. And so I would submit to you, do we even need to find prostate cancer in the first place if it is not a harmful entity? And so there is data on baseline PSA screening and long-term risk of prostate cancer diagnosis. This is a study that was published by Hans Lilia, 
and looking at prostate cancer diagnosis up to 25 years later using a baseline PSA measurement. And the data is pretty impressive. It shows that if your PSA is under one between the age of 44 and 50 years old, then your long-term risk of prostate cancer diagnosis is quite, quite low, under 10%. But if your baseline PSA rose above one, then you can see, especially on the curve on the right, your long-term risk of prostate cancer rises exponentially, logarithmically. And so that age group should have a PSA under one with quite a high predictive uh, ability. So there you go. However, diagnosis of prostate cancer, as we all know, does not mean an inevitable death from prostate cancer. We need to separate out the tortoises from the hares. And so other research has been done looking at baseline PSA and more important endpoints, such as metastasis or death from prostate cancer. This is a study that looked at baseline PSA at the age of 60 and long-term risk of prostate cancer, METS, or death. It, in, it, it took from a sample of 1,100 men from the Malmo Preventative Project, which was a primary care study based in Sweden. And what we see is that if your PSA age of 60 was over two, you had an almost 13 times greater risk of clinically significant or clinically diagnosed prostate cancer, almost 17 times higher risk of being diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer, and an almost 26 times higher risk of dying from prostate cancer. So quite impressive data. So the concentration of PSA at age 60 really can predict for a lifetime risk of METS or death from prostate cancer. And of course, most deaths from prostate cancer occurred in men with a baseline PSA over two. So this is a one-time PSA value taken at age 60. Uh, this is a study that I'm quite proud of, uh, published a few years ago in JAMA. This is a validation of the same kind of data in a larger cohort. We looked at 11,000 men from the intervention arm of the PLCO trial. So these were men that were supposed to and did undergo PSA testing or screening at study entry. And we looked at the youngest cohort of men in the study, which were ages 55 to 60, because accrual of this study only started at age 55. Uh, we looked at clinically important risk of prostate cancer at 13 years follow-up, and we defined important prostate cancer as either a clinical T2B cancer, so you had a large nodule uh, on DRE, or if you had a biopsy, it was Gleason grade greater than seven, or if you underwent radical prostatectomy, if you were found to have Gleason grade, uh, Gleason score, sorry, higher than seven, if you had extracapsular extension or invasion into the seminal vesicles, or if you died from prostate cancer. Of course, regardless of grade or stage, if you died from prostate cancer, that is considered a clinically important cancer. We then stratified outcomes by baseline PSA between the ages of 55 and 60. And what we found is that if your baseline PSA was up to uh, two, then your risk of a clinically significant prostate cancer, as per the definition on the left, was quite low, up to only about 5%. It should be noted, though, that there were only 15 prostate cancer-associated deaths at 13 years follow-up in our cohort, which just speaks to the indolent nature of prostate cancer. This is the same data, but organized into a graph. And what you can see uh, on the right-hand side is that the, the curves that are at the lowest uh, end of the spectrum are the baseline PSAs that are under 2, and their risk of long-term clinically significant prostate cancer was quite low. And the reason I show it to you this way is because this actually represents about 83% of the patients in this study. So if we are to adopt a baseline PSA model with subsequent risk stratification, then this could have an effect on the majority of men who choose to undergo screening. So is there really enough evidence to enact a baseline PSA strategy for screening? And I would submit to you that there is plenty of data. As you can see, lots of studies have been published and this one dates back all the way to 2001. So we've known about this, uh, this method of using PSA for over 20 years, but we still haven't been able to convince primary care doctors to enact such a, a, a strategy shift. What about level one evidence? That's what everyone's looking for. Uh, so there are a few studies that are ongoing. This is the CAP randomized trial, and this is looking at about 400,000 men between the ages of 50 and 70, so average risk men in the UK. 
They're taking a single baseline PSA versus no screening at all approach. And so far we have data at about 10 years and no difference in mortality between these age, uh, between these groups of a single baseline PSA versus no screening. But you can see that the curves are starting to separate out. And so of course we need more data. We need longer term follow-up in any prostate cancer trial that's worth its salt. You need at least 15 to 20 years of data. The contamination in the control group so far has been about 10 to 15 percent, which is a much more reasonable and expected contamination rate. We need longer follow up. This is a different trial that's looking at uh, a little bit more of a complicated risk stratification approach. This is called the probase trial, and I'll try and break it down for you uh, here. They're taking an immediate screening or a baseline PSA at age 45 in one group, and then in another group, they're taking a delayed screening at age 50, and then they're stratifying by their baseline PSA value. So if your PSA is either under one and a half or between one and a half and three or over three, you go through a different workflow. Um, if their PSA is under one and a half, they get a repeat PSA every five years, as long as it stays under one and a half. If their PSA is between one and a half and three, they get a PSA test every two years, as long as it stays in that, in that, uh, uh, between that range. And if your PSA is over three, you go for an immediate MRI and a biopsy. And so the outcomes that they're looking for are incidents of metastatic prostate cancer. So pretty meaningful endpoint until the age of 60. And so we're eagerly awaiting the results of this trial. So I submit to you that if we adopt baseline PSA correctly, we should see a grade, but not necessarily a stage migration at diagnosis, meaning that we should see less grade group one or Gleason six at diagnosis and more grade groups two to five or Gleason seven to 10 at diagnosis. Maybe we'll start to see less active surveillance because we're only going to be identifying patients at higher risk of clinically significant cancer. Will we see an improvement in prostate cancer-specific survival? Well, that's the big question. That remains to be seen. So another question that is posed and answered in the updated guidelines is when can prostate cancer screening be stopped? So they say that for men under the age of 60, with a PSA less than one, you can consider discontinuation of PSA screening. And this speaks to the baseline PSA and risk stratification model in trying to reduce overdiagnosis and overtreatment of indolent cancer. So round of applause for this screening uh, guideline. For all other men, they can discontinue PSA screening at age 70. I agree with this as well. The evidence for diagnosing and treating prostate cancer after the age of 70 is very, very limited. There is almost no data supporting uh, the treatment of prostate cancer after the age of 70. For men with a life expectancy of less than 10 years also, please discontinue PSA screening, and that will be at the discretion of the physician. Adjunctive strategies for improving prostate cancer early diagnosis. So the tools that are currently at our disposal, nothing can replace clinical judgment. The age of the patient, their digital rectal exam, what about their comorbidities, their life expectancy? This is all nuanced stuff that is at the discretion of the physician. But we also have some fancier tests that we can use, such as free PSA, PSA density. These are isoforms or other ways of looking at PSA. We can look at PSA velocity. Uh, there are some molecular biomarkers that are now commercially available. They cost a bit of money, but they can be quite helpful. Uh, I'll talk to you about a few of those. Then we have MRI and pre and post biopsy genomics. So these are all methods for p uh, putting patients in a correct risk stratified group. The primary care community may not be aware that we have these tools other than history and physical at our disposal. So for example, the 4K score, it is prospectively validated. It is based on four isoforms of PSA, the total PSA, free, intact, and calocrine-related peptide 2, PSA being a part of the calocrine family of proteins, so uh, and PSA is human calocrine-related peptide 3, so they're looking at a different calocrine in order to create a nomogram-generated score of the risk of clinically insignificant and clinically important prostate cancer with a pretty impressive area under the curve of 
And this can potentially reduce unnecessary biopsies. And so this is the, an example of a score sheet that you might get. And one thing that I like about this is that, for example, this patient is only at 5% risk of a clinically significant cancer would put them in the low risk group. And they even give you references here of the validated studies. And this can help predict aggressive or Gleason 7 or higher prostate cancer if you were to perform a biopsy. So a lot of people call this a liquid biopsy. I think that that's a bit of a misnomer. This does not replace a tissue diagnosis of prostate cancer, but this can certainly help to decide who does and who does not need a biopsy with a pretty high degree of certainty. And patients with a, a, a score of lower than seven and a half in the validation study had under a 1% risk of having metastatic prostate cancer within 20 years. So you can hang your hat on that one with a, a high degree of confidence. So what if 4K or prostate health index or ISO PSA or select MDX, these are other molecular biomarkers, what if they're not available to you in your office or in your hospital or if the patients can't afford these tests? Well, you can use different isoforms of PSA that are much cheaper with also a pretty uh, uh, impressive area under the curve. Free PSA percentage can be predictive of clinically significant prostate cancer. And we want a higher value to be protective. So the higher your free PSA, the more protective that is, uh, or the less chance you have of having a clinically significant prostate cancer. There's PSA density. So the amount of PSA in your blood compared to the volume of your prostate, that can only be obtained through imaging modalities, either transrectal ultrasound or MRI. Uh, DRE, I think, is a bit of an unreliable way to uh, to get PSA density, although if you don't have the means, then a DRE can suffice. And we want a lower value. So a lower PSA density is associated with a lower risk of clinically significant prostate cancer. There's urine-based tests such as PCA3. There are gene fusion tests that are obtained in the urine. Uh, the, the one that has received the most attention but didn't really pan out in the long term was the Tempris 2 ERG gene fusion event. We have nomograms that are disposable that are available online for free, such as the prostate cancer prevention trial nomogram or the ERSPC nomogram. And so, for example, for patients that either can afford or cannot obtain a 4K test when the pretest probability of a clinically significant prostate cancer is equivocal, I will then take them through the nomogram online. So we'll go to the PCPT calculator, calculator, we'll type in their demographic and their clinical information, and this is the type of of readout that we get. And it's very impressive for patients to see the, the happy smiley faces, the, the yellow concerned faces, and the, the upset uh, red faces. And so for this particular patient, it's a good visual representation of their risk of clinically uh, significant prostate cancer, which may assist in shared decision making of whether to undergo a biopsy or not. So in the guidelines, they also talk about MRI. Um, get an MRI prior to every biopsy, does the evidence support this? So the guidelines state that clinicians may use MRI prior to initial biopsy to increase the detection of Gleason grade group two or higher prostate cancer. And in patients undergoing a repeat biopsy with no prior MRI, clinicians should obtain a prostate MRI prior to biopsy. So this is important language to pay attention to. So let's talk about the, the big randomized trial that was done to support the use of pre-biopsy MRI. This is the precision study that compared multiparametric MRI and targeted biopsy using both computer and cognitive methods uh, and compared it to standard trust biopsy alone for the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. It was multi-center, randomized. It was a non-inferiority trial, importantly. And uh, again, used a variety of systems and biopsy approaches, both computer-assisted and cognitive. Uh, the targeted group included men with or without a targeted biopsy. In the multi-parametric MRI targeted biopsy group, clinically significant cancer was detected 38% of the time versus 26 in the standard trust biopsy group. This was statistically significant. And importantly also, 28% of patients who received an MRI had a negative MRI and thus they were not biopsied. And this represents a limitation of the study because you don't know what you don't know, but it was specifically designed this way in order to discover what the detection rate of clinically significant prostate cancer is. So there were fewer grade group one prostate cancers detected in the targeted biopsy group, which is also important for clinical decision-making. But I would like you to 
consider the following scenario. So this is a patient who's undergone a targeted and systematic biopsy. So targets or biopsies A and B represent systematic biopsies. And the color scheme in front of you represents uh, low and high grade cancers. And then C, D, and E are MRI targeted biopsies. And so the blue represents low grade cancer, grade three. And then the red represents grade four cancer. So in the systematic biopsy, uh, we're going to pick up plus four because it will have gone through both the low and high grade component of the tumor. And as we know, prostate cancer is heterogeneous and multifocal. And then in the MRI targeted biopsies, we're likely going to see Gleason 4 plus 4 or grade group 4, so more aggressive cancer. But is that a true representation of the biology of this disease when, in fact, pathologically, this patient is probably 3 plus 4? So there is a risk of overgrading with targeted biopsy. And are we really missing that many high-grade cancers with a standard biopsy template? And for that, I, I would urge you to consider that the metastatic rates on active surveillance are actually quite low, 1%, uh, according to the long-term data of multiple studies. And so um, this is kind of the counter-argument to MRI-targeted biopsies. And of course, just because you discover a high-grade cancer, we don't really know everything about its biology. And so what is the biology of a standard uh, pickup versus a targeted pickup of a prostate cancer? So this, this remains to be seen. Again, here's some anti-MRI, anti-repeat biopsy uh, argument for you, because I think it's important to understand the data for and against MRI-targeted biopsies. So this study is from the Danish Cancer Registry, uh, looking at patients from about 1995 to 2011. And these are 63,000 men who underwent a trust biopsy with no targets. And these are sextant biopsies because, again, remember, these are patients that underwent biopsy in, in uh, uh, you know, a prior time, especially in the mid to late 90s, uh, a 12 to 14 core biopsy was not the standard of care. And they had 20 years of follow-up, so a really robust follow-up period. And so after a benign biopsy, the cumulative incidence of prostate cancer-specific mortality was only 5.2% uh, versus 59.9% or almost 60% of mortality from other causes. And especially if your PSA was under 10, the cumulative incidence of prostate cancer-specific mortality was under 1%. So if you are over the age of 65, for example, and you've had one negative biopsy and your PSA is 5 or 6, you can, with a high degree of confidence, tell your patients that their risk of prostate cancer-specific mortality is very low. And you could consider uh, stopping PSA screening or at least uh, a much reduced intensity of PSA screening in these patients. So the PSA gestalt that I will submit to you, the, the whole story of PSA is that every PSA workup is unique and we need to use our brains. Uh, of course, there's no replacement for history and physical. You need to take into account the patient's age, whether or not they have symptoms, uh, comorbidities and life expectancy, their family history, whether they've had a single or multiple previous PSA values where you can determine a PSA velocity, for example. H&P is still very, very important. We should familiarize ourselves and use, uh, of course, uh, uh, cautiously and uh, not ubiquitously, but we should selectively use the tools at our disposal. There's no replacement for best clinical judgment. That I think is still the best tool available, but we have nomograms. We have commercially available biomarkers. There is MRI and genomic classifiers, which can help to diagnose and risk stratify patients so that we can do the correct thing for them. We should endeavor to maximize benefit and minimize harm. So what do the primary care doctors really need? Uh, so according to the USPSTF, the United States Preventative Service Task Force, it's a grade C recommendation, meaning that it is shared decision-making. But what does this really mean? What is shared decision-making? There are those that would say that you should either do PSA screening right or not do it at all. And now we're kind of in this gray area where we have to do shared decision-making, but it really depends on 
the 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 bias and the belief system of the doctor doing the shared decision making with the patient. So at Rutgers, for example, we developed a screening decision aid for men, and this was done in conjunction with primary care leadership in order to devise a screening decision aid with language that was agreeable to all parties and that we felt proposed PSA screening in a very balanced manner. So we want to tell patients what the prostate is. We want to educate them on what prostate cancer is and if they're at risk of getting it. Uh, we want to introduce to them concepts of how we diagnose prostate cancer. What are the reasons that you may choose to do PSA testing? Or what are some of the reasons that you may choose not to do PSA testing? So this is this balanced or shared decision-making approach that we're very proud of. What does a PSA test mean? And if the PSA test is high, you might see the urologist. Well, who is the urologist? What do we do? So this kind of takes a little bit of the mystery uh, out of PSA screening and the, the subsequent outcomes of a positive or negative test. What if I'm diagnosed with prostate cancer? So we wanted to go a little bit further down the rabbit hole to, again, take some of the mystery uh, or some of the scariness away from the patient. And then we have a self-assessment tool that is proposed to the patient at the end of the decision aid where it, it poses to the patient if you would accept prostate cancer treatment, if we recommended it, or if you're comfortable living with an untreated prostate cancer, hinting at active surveillance. Um, are you okay with that? And if you're not okay with either of those things, then maybe screening is not right for you. So we like to put it to the patient so that they can have an active role in making a decision whether to undergo PSA screening. And now a few words about transrectal versus transperineal biopsy. Uh, I am an adopter of transperineal biopsy. And so one of the recommendations in the guidelines is that clinicians may use either transrectal or transperineal biopsy route when performing a biopsy with uh, the conditional recommendation level of evidence grade C, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit more in depth about the evidence supporting transperineal biopsy. So in Britain, we have this tongue in cheek term called Trexit, the shift to transperineal biopsy. And so this is what it looks like. Sorry for the graphic nature of this image. This is a, an ultrasound probe in the rectum, but the biopsy needle is going through the perineum. This can be somewhat technically challenging, especially when you're doing it totally freehand, like this physician over here. Uh, but there are methods to overcoming the technical challenges. And uh, once you're over the learning curve, then it becomes as easy as performing a transrectal biopsy. So why transperineal in the first place? Well, I think this image is self-explanatory. We're going through the rectum. It's dirty. It's full of bacteria. And then we could potentially introduce this bacteria into the soft tissue into the bloodstream leading to infections and sepsis. So complications of transrectal biopsy are well documented. Infection rates, depending on the study you're looking at, range between 5 to 7%. I think that's an over uh, estimation of infection rates, especially since we now use double antibiotic coverage. Uh, but certainly it's not without its complication rates. We, we are seeing increasing antibiotic resistance. Uh, a lot of bugs are getting smart and we're not really developing any new antibiotics. Um, and so the, the bugs are outpacing us. And so it's something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of AUA recommendations for infection avoidance, well, they tell you for truss, for transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, you could do a rectal culture. Um, you could do targeted prophylaxis based on that rectal culture. You could augment your antibiotic coverage by giving a combination of a fluoroquinolone or a first, second, third generation cephalosporin or gentamicin or some other antibiotic coverage combination or transperineal approach. And I think that this, uh, this graph is pretty hilarious because you can do all these complicated things or you can just do a transperineal biopsy. So I, I quite like this graph. Um, the EAU... Uh, the Europeans are always more avant-garde. They're always more willing to push the envelope of, of clinical care. And so for them, transperineal biopsy, sorry, is the first choice, as you can see on the left, when performing a prostate biopsy. And I think that we should adopt this approach here in the United States. There is uh, a multitude of studies looking at infection risk with transperineal root. Um, most of these are looking at transperineal biopsy without or with a first-generation uh, cephalosporin versus single or double antibiotic coverage with the transrectal approach. And most studies are leaning either mildly or heavily on the side uh, in favor of transperineal biopsy of decreased infection risk. 
Transperineal biopsy without antibiotics leads to an exceptionally low risk of infection, as you can see. And also, I think that there's better, better diagnostic capability of transperineal. So this is a nice study that was done. It's a, a big data collection of prostate cancer diagnosed uh, uh, nationally and uh, combined all that data uh, to create a heat map of prostate cancer in tens of thousands of patients that have been diagnosed with the disease. And as you can see, the traditional, uh, I, I would say, um, the, the traditional thoughts or the dogma of thinking that most prostate cancers are in the peripheral zone, but maybe 20 or 30% are in the transition zone is really disproven by this study. It's really all peripheral zone. And anterior cancers are still peripheral zone cancers because you can see how the peripheral zone kind of wraps around anteriorly on the prostate like a horn. And so the cancers that we thought that were trans transitional zone or central zone cancers are most likely peripheral zone cancers that are anterior in the PZ or that have extended into the transition zone from the PZ. So this is my biopsy template. This is not something that everyone has to adopt. There are different templates. I use a 20 core template with 10 sections. And uh, sometimes in smaller prostates, you don't necessarily need to sample the base because you can get across the peripheral zone uh, in, in one section, both base, mid, and apex um, with one biopsy uh, section in smaller prostates. In larger prostates, you may have to extend into the base. The limitation of truss is, of course, anterior, and the limitation of transperineal is reaching the base, but it's easily accessible just by pushing the gun a little bit further. And so in my practice, um, I use a, a, a fusion technology called Coelis. Um, and so we're able to map the prostate, map lesions, perform targeted biopsies, but also map the entire peripheral zone of the prostate. And so again, based on heat map, large data, a big data collection of prostate cancer topography, I think that this is a better way to sample cancers. We have a large African-American population in Newark. Black men are um, have been associated with more anterior cancers and later diagnosis of these cancers. And so I think this is a, a really good approach for getting a complete picture of the peripheral zone uh, in patients. And so here's some data to, to show an improved cancer detection with TP biopsy. Clinically significant prostate cancer uh, detection in, in TP in this study was 32% versus 20% in the transrectal approach. Total cancer detection uh, is about 44%. So about half of my patients end up having some sort of prostate cancer. That's what I'm seeing in my clinical practice versus about 30% in the transrectal approach. Uh, in men on active surveillance, biopsy is associated with cancer upgrading. So probably putting patients in a more correct risk group. Although again, you have to harken back to the data that is very favorable for patients on active surveillance with very low metastatic rates, very low death rates. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. But if it's about putting patients in the correct risk stratified group, I think TP biopsy is superior. In patients, uh, again, on active surveillance, transperineal biopsy alone was an independent predictor of upgrading on, on subsequent biopsy. So in conclusion, a credibility issue. Technology. We have very well-intentioned, uh, aggressive diagnosis and treatment of all prostate cancers in North America over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, again, very well-intentioned, but this resulted in over-diagnosis and over-treatment of indolent cancers. And so now we have to win the trust back from the population and from the primary care community. I don't think we need to do away with PSA altogether. I think it's still the best biomarker out there. We just need to use it a little bit differently. I think we need more intelligent use of PSA as a risk stratification tool rather than as purely a diagnostic tool. It can be predictive as well. And so the challenge for the next generation of urologists, and hopefully if you're watching this lecture, you are part of the next generation, is to improve screening practices and to appropriately select patients for radical therapy. We should endeavor to accurately characterize and treat those at only highest risk of prostate cancer-related morbidity or mortality, and of course, leave everyone else alone. And so with that, I wish to thank you for your attention. Thank you for viewing this lecture. Um, and uh, I am happy to answer questions via email. You can DM me via Twitter. And thank you again 
to the Empire Consortium for the invite to provide this lecture. Uh, and thank you very much and have a good day.